wonderful prayer. Thank you, Brian, for that wonderful prayer. You must have been reading my mind because in that prayer you asked God something that I had uh, talked to, to about <coughs> earlier today. And I was thanking God for our students and how each of you is in a position that when crunch time comes, people are going to come to you for the answers. And your, your responsibility is going to show them, lead them to the Lord. And, and these are difficult days, and um, because we're studying the Word of God, we're getting the answers that people need. And so thank you, Brian, for praying that, and pray that God will open those opportunities that we will show people who you are, God, uh, through the Word of God. We thank you, Brian, and um, that God will I pray that God will keep us all ready. And it's so important that we study the Bible, study the Word of God. Uh, this is where the answers are. The answers are not in the government. The answers are not in even in the church. The answer is not going to a church or attending a fellowship. The answer is not in being able to go to the mall anytime you want to or uh, to hop in your car and go wherever you want. The answer is not in, uh, in the United States Constitution. The answer is not in the uh, Declaration of Independence. The answer is in the Word of God. And so we thank God for the Bible. And so we assemble every Wednesday night to hear, study, and hear the Word of God and focus on the Word of God. Praise God. Okay. So, Jackie Carter, you're looking good. Um, we see you there. Praise God. Come on and give us a greeting at, before we get started, okay? Good evening, everybody. As always, it's good to be in your company, even if it's by way of technology. Looking forward to tonight's discussion and trying to stay warm. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And um, I get questions every week about our homework and, and about... Uh, the assignments, and you all are doing very well in your homework. Um, and if you need a one-on-one, -on -one, if you need uh, some clarification about anything, get in touch with me. Send me a text message. Send me an email. And um, um, I'd be glad to talk with you and work with you on a one-on-one on, -on, -one on, on, on the homework assignments. These homework assignments are challenging, but the key, the key is to read your assignments. Read. You can't do these assignments thoroughly or effectively without reading the assigned scriptures. And so tonight we're looking at our assignment is to read Second Chronicles chapters 1 through 10, whether or not we complete cover in our lesson, our presentation, Second Chronicles 1 through 10, this is our assignment. And I put on Facebook today, to invite people to join us for Bible study, that um, the solution, the solution to our nation's ills and the needs of the world are right here in the book of Chronicles. If people would read uh, not just the whole Bible, but if people would uh, uh, focus on um, in these times on Chronicles and what happened to Israel, and what's happening in the United States and in the other nations, people could get a grip, a grasp of why we're going through what we're going through. And this will also prepare us for what's coming next, because more evil is coming. Worse things are coming. But the answer is in the scriptures. And um, Brian asked me a wonderful question today. And um, Brian, uh, if if... If I have your permission, well, I'd rather you ask the question. You asked me about the uh, the um, coronavirus. Could you ask that publicly, Brian, if you if it's not embarrassing? Sure. Um, yeah, my question basically was, um, uh, do, you, or do you think the, this virus is going to get better as, this, as time goes on, or when, when do you think it's going to get better? Okay, okay, okay. And I did send you an email answer, and my answer was something like this. Um, I believe that um, 
things are going to get even worse. And I believe they're going. And, and I, I, quant, I qualify what I'm saying because I really don't think, Brian, and I really don't think, ladies and gentlemen, that God is pleased with our response to Him. I don't think there's a, 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 enough repentance in this nation. I don't believe there's enough repentance in this world, and I'm not the judge on whether or not someone repents, but uh, the Bible says we shall see them by their fruits. You can tell when someone has a repentant heart by the way they speak to you, by, by the way they address you. Uh, and I, I don't think in world life that there has been enough repentance to really turn God's heart. And by this I mean uh, repentance has to come from my house, your house, to the White House, or to whatever house there is where people are, and, and, and that the love of Christ must flow from me to you to others uh, the way we treat people, our attitude to his people is, is a result of whether or not we have a repentant heart and whether he, we have love flowing in our heart. And then our attitude to God. When a nation uh, debates and, and, and goes through what we're experiencing on a daily basis, pointing the finger and uh, hiring and firing and then... Um, setting up this agency and trying this and trying that and, and at the same time uh, getting uh, press coverage that is negative uh, and nobody is mentioning, not from the top where you hear, don't even hear it from the church. You don't hear people saying repent, repent, repent. When America repents, when the nations repent, then, Brian, we will see a change. And so... Uh, you're, you're asking a question that many people have asked. I don't have the answer, but my, my thoughts on this are when the people do what God has said in Second Chronicles. That's why this study is so important tonight. When the people do what God said, then we will see a change, not only nationally, but internationally. And it's all the, I mean, the, the plan, the outline is here. It's all in this book. And, uh, it, and we, we see the same thing from Genesis to Revelation. God, God punishes when there is sin. And uh, to me, Brian, I do not believe that um, this, this coronavirus is, is just some, some uh, wave of a, of a, of a sickness that, that uh, is just out there because of uh, maybe the cattle were plagued or the chickens were plagued or the pigs were plagued or whatever. No, I believe that this is a, a, a punishment, a judgment on America, a judgment on the world because people, and you see this in their leaders, in our leadership in this nation and the nation's People have, have made themselves into their own gods. They do whatever they want to do. They say what they want to say, and they've kicked God off the planet. They've kicked God out of everything, and God is saying, hey, I am God. And God is doing, I believe, God is doing exactly what he did with Pharaoh. He will make people know whom he is and who he is. And so we shall see. We shall see. But for us, our job, uh, and I share this with Brian, is to keep on trusting in the Lord, keep, keep our faith in the Lord. And ladies and gentlemen, whether or not you agree with me, that doesn't matter. Stay focused on God. There, I don't hear many people, I don't even hear many preachers saying, we have sinned against God and we're going through this because we have sinned against God and we have to repent. I don't even hear preacher saying that, but I'm saying it, but I do want to encourage you, stay focused on the Lord. If this virus lasts for a long time, uh, and maybe some of us may not even see the end of it, but okay. stay faithful 
and trust in the Lord with all your heart. Worship God. I believe God is calling us to worship him and to trust him and to tell as many others, many people as you can that Jesus Christ is Lord and it's time for people to get right with God. And so that's where I am on this, Brian and my friends. And I'm, I'm doing the Psalm 91 thing, and I'd like to roll you over to Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say unto the Lord, he's my refuge, my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. His truth shall be our shield and buckler. When we trust in God, don't put your trust in the government. Don't put your, put your trust in the stimulus checks. And don't, don't put your trust in this. Trust in the Lord. And when we return to the Lord, there are many people, they want to return to their church fellowships. Ladies and gentlemen, I say return to the Lord. There are a lot of people who cannot go to church today, but I think they ought to go first to the Lord, get a relationship with the Lord, use this time to get closer to the Lord. Enough said. That's my editorial. And so let's look at uh, Second Chronicles chapter 1. We're going to look at these uh, chapter um, descriptions. Chapter 1, Solomon becomes king, and Solomon asks for wisdom. Chapter 2, Solomon and Hiram, the king of Tyre. It's a good thing that Solomon's father, David, had a good relationship with Hiram, the king of Tyre, and Sidon, Sodom, Sidon, Sidon, S-I-D-O-N, because that's where he received much of the materials to build the house, the temple. Chapter 3, Temple Dimensions. Chapter 4, we're going to look at the altar furnishings. Chapter 5, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is moved. Chapter 6, Solomon praises God. And then that powerful prayer in Chapter 6, Solomon's powerful prayer. Chapter 7, the Lord appeared to Solomon. And we see in, in, in this um, appearance to Solomon, we see God saying, if my people. Ladies and gentlemen, this chapter 7 is so powerful. And I say chapter 7, um, verse 14, is the solution to the coronavirus. Chapter 7, 14, is the solution to whatever ails you. And God is speaking not just to the people of Israel. God is speaking to people everywhere, in every nation. This is a word to every nation where people call themselves by God's name who are God's children. This is not just, please, when people tell you, oh, the Bible is just for the Jews, the Bible has no relevance today, rebuke them, rebuke them, rebuke them. Be nice to them, rebuke them, chastise them. Let them know, know the Bible is for all ages and for all nations, the Bible is the God's blueprint for a successful living. It's God's blueprint to take us from the cradle to heaven. And uh, people need to study the Word of God. It is so important that people read the Word of God. Please do not entertain people who say the Bible uh, is written uh, just for the Jews, or or others will say, well, the Bible has errors, it's fallible, it's written by man. No, no, learn your scripture. Tell them, rebuke them, rebuke people. Tell them, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. The answer that you give to people should be based on what the Word of God says, and we study the Word of God. Ladies and gentlemen, do not be like the Pope. The Pope, I saw a picture of the Pope on Facebook kissing the Koran. I ain't kissing the Koran. The Koran is a corrupt book. The Koran is not the Holy Scriptures. 
the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is the Holy Scriptures. And, and, and there, there's really, uh, the, I don't think there's really any blessing in kissing the Bible. Why kiss it if you don't understand its contents? Don't be religious. Don't be fooled and deceived by religions. The Bible is the word of God. The Pope kissed the Koran, so the, co the Pope embraces Islam. I do not kiss the Koran. I do not embrace Islam. Islam is a false religion. Uh, the Koran is a corrupt book. It's, 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 uh, it is not divinely inspired and is not written by a divinely inspired person. And so we need to take a stand. We need to know whom we believe in, what we believe in. And it's time for Christians to read the Bible and to get into the Word. Enough, enough said. As I said <clears throat> five minutes ago, enough said on that. But it just like must be some editorials in me tonight. And anyway, when we get to chapter 8 of Second Chronicles, we see Solomon building cities, chapter 9, tributes to Solomon, and then the visit from the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba came from her country to visit Solomon. And then later on, we see in chapter 9, Solomon's death. And then chapter 10 begins a whole new era in Jewish history. And we see Rehoboam. Rehoboam, Solomon's son who takes over the kingdom, he blew it. He messed up. He was very harsh. He was like uh, a leader we know today. Uh, he was very harsh with people. He was very nasty with people. He was very mean with people. And he did not last long. He did not last long. We see the kingdom divided during Rehoboam's uh, reign. Uh, as king. Rehoboam was a nasty man. He hated older people. He hated people. He was full of hatred. And he uh, gathered around him certain people who kissed up to him. And they helped bring about the destruction of the great empire, the great nation that David had built up and Solomon had built up. But it's all the result of sin with Rehoboam and the uh, 19 kings who followed after Rehoboam, you see the destruction of Israel as their leaders took the lead, with the exception of, of about five or six righteous leaders, uh, Jeho Asa, Jehoshaphat, uh, Joash, Josiah, and Hezekiah, about five of them, maybe six of them, who are called good kings. The rest of them were corrupt. So let's take a look at uh, Second Chronicles. Does anyone have any questions before we go any further with our study tonight? Okay, I have a question. Not, yes. I have a question, mm -hmm. Pastor Carter. This yes. is Minister mm -hmm. Loretta. Um, is there anywhere in the Bible where it states who the Queen of Sheba was? Please ask that again. Does it state um, the name of who Queen, Queen Sheba was in the Bible? In the Not in the Bible. Not in the Bible, but in Ethiopian history, they name her and um, name her husband. Um, um, when she came to Israel, she was unmarried, but then later she married when she went back to Ethiopia. Ethiopian history is rich in information about the Queen of Sheba. Sheba is a name given to Ethiopia, um, oh, okay. um, and they are descendants of the Cushites. So I have a book okay. that I wrote called Black Heroes of the Bible. She's one of my 21 personalities in that book, Black Heroes of the Bible. Um, but no, she is not named in the Bible. And uh, there are several people who are not named in the Bible. You've got to do some research to find out who they were, what their names were, okay. um, and to lock them into their phase of history. So um, 
talk to me. Let's talk about that. Maybe maybe later on get you a copy of that book, Black Heroes of the Bible. It's a good story um, because once you once you follow her story, once you follow the Queen of Sheba, Loretta, um, uh -huh. you can get into a whole lot of a whole lot of stuff, speculation, and a whole lot of stuff. And in Ethiopian history, just like in a whole lot of other history, even American history. Whoa. You know, you get a whole lot of stuff that it ain't real, like Pecos mm -hmm. Bill rode a cyclone, rode a cyclone in Texas. I mean, we, we we were growing up thinking there was a little cowboy who had a rope and he rode a cyclone. Whoopee tie I O, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> doc, hey, Doctor Gene Bratton, whoopee tie I O. And so they have the same similar stories, and they have a they have a story about. Uh, the Queen of Sheba saying she had sex with uh, King Solomon. Yes. And they they yes. had a son and they named that son Menelik. He became King Menelik the first of Ethiopia, and the Ethiopians will shoot you down with 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 assault weapons if you talk about uh, again anything negative against the the uh, Queen of Sheba and Menelik. You know, and and uh, they hate Solomon's guts. So you got to really be careful when you start looking at historical. Uh, all stuff about people because just like what we're learning today, all the news ain't good news. Yes, amen. George Washington did not chop down a cherry tree and 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 and, and, and say what he did. Okay? And um a whole I mean a whole I mean history when you look at history, a lot of history's been messed up because a lot of history yeah. is written by people giving us fake news. Fake news mm -hmm. fake news even to the point where even to the point where we're in Jewish history in the history of the Jewish people there are a lot of people in America who claim there was no Holocaust well the Holocaust mm. was real it cost the Jews 12 million people in Germany alone but why don't you get any history about the 12 million people, the 12 million Jews that Joseph Stalin killed in Russia at the same time? We're looking at 24 million people killed in World War, during the World War II era, actually between the 1930s and World War II, because they were Jewish. But you only hear about the 12 million killed by Adolf Hitler, uh, putting them in furnaces in 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 uh, Germany, but you don't hear anything about Joseph Stalin and his cruel, corrupt, nasty self, all the, the 12 million Jews he killed in Russia. But you don't get anything about it because why? Because American journalists and newspapers were afraid to talk about Stalin because Russia was our ally in World War II. We had the guts to ally ourselves with, with Joseph Stalin, one of the most corrupt people ever to walk the face of the earth, one of the meanest, nastiest people ever to live a life on this earth. So, man, I got way out there, Sister Loretta. No, we don't know the Queen of Sheba's name. We don't know. Okay. Thanks for roping me back and bringing me back in Holy Spirit. whoopee tie -I -O. Okay. And Solomon, the king of David, was strengthened in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and magnified him exceedingly. And then um, Solomon spoke unto all Israel, to the captains of thousands and of hundreds, and to the judges and to every governor in all Israel, the chief of the fathers. And Solomon and all the congregation with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon, for there was the tabernacle of the congregation of God, which Moses, a servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. And so the tabernacle is at Gibeon. Solomon, upon becoming king, organized. He was most highly organized. David had a highly organized kingdom. Solomon was, Solomon was more organized than David. And so they celebrated at the tabernacle. And, I'm, and I read this today and I said, well, I, I never saw this before. The tabernacle was at Gibeon, but the Ark of the Covenant was not in the tabernacle. Look at this. Verse 4, But the Ark of God had David brought up from Kerjath Jearim to the place which David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. So the tabernacle was still erected 
at Gibeon, but the Ark of the Covenant was at in Jerusalem. So eventually when Solomon builds the temple, he will bring the Ark of the Covenant from uh, its place and, 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 and place it in the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, so there's some very interesting things when we read, when we read, and, and read your scriptures, read. You might have to read these scriptures over and over again. Verse 7, in that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, ask what I shall give thee. <clears throat> and Solomon said unto God, thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father. And has made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David, my father, be established. For thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. And so, uh, when Solomon became king, Solomon realized he could not govern the people without the help of God. What do you think would happen, ladies and gentlemen, if our leaders... And leaders of the nations will say, God, I cannot govern without your help. And verse 7, so, so powerful. In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. Now, I'm going to say something. <clears throat> and I hope, it, you know, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I, I read this, and I became a little bit jealous. Karen, I read this, and I became a little bit jealous. I said, God, how come you never at, woke me up at night and asked me what you can give me? Now, see, that, and, and I repent, Lord, and that's a sin. I repent of it, and, and, and I know it's pride. I, I repent, of, repent of pride and, and this, but have you ever read the Bible and said, well, Lord, uh, uh, you did this for so-and-so. What about me? Have, have any of you ever had the courage, the guts to ask God, well, God, oh, what about me? You did this for David. You did this for Amen. Paul. Oh, 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 you, oh, 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 but but what, 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 what about me? What about me? Now, I know it sounds like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son who said to his father, well, look, hey, hey, look, this, this boy took all of your money, went out and splur splurged it on, 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 on women, and this and that, and now he's coming back, and, and, and you've given him the best robe and put your ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. But what, what about me? What do you ever give me? Now, so I read this, and I said, Lord, how come you haven't appeared to me at night and asked me, what can you give me? Now, I might have opened myself up because the Lord, just, <laughs> the Lord just might, Jackie, he just might, he just might wake me up and say, okay, let's talk about this. What is it that you want? What can I give you? And, and if he does, hallelujah, praise God, praise God. And if he does, I hope I say something sensible. You know, <laughs> I, I hope I say something sensible. But I just wondered if any of you have ever experienced that. And then... Uh, Solomon uh, praised God for do, showing great mercy to David, his father, and making Solomon the king. And, uh, and he asked God, verse 9, Now, O Lord, will you uh, let your promise unto David, my father, be established? For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth and multitude. Lord, these are, there's a, these are a lot of people. And, and how can I rule over them? without you. And so verse 10, give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? And even if, 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 if God were to appear to us and ask us, what can I give you? Uh, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea, ladies and gentlemen, to ask God, God bless our president, bless our Congress, bless our leaders. Or make it uh, uh, even uh, more personal. God bless me. Give me wisdom that I can live this life and be a witness for you. For I cannot do it without you. 
And so as, as I think about this coronavirus and the, the quarantines and the uh, self-distancing and the shutting, shutting in that many people are experiencing, and I think about Brian's question, this is a good time to seek the Lord. Lord, draw me closer to you. Give me the wisdom to live the way you have purpose for me to live and to do what you have done. And, and then even as you're praying for yourself, Lord, and bless our leaders, local, state, and federal officials. Give them wisdom uh, to, to lead uh, our localities and our states and our nations into your holiness and into your righteousness. This is how we build a righteous nation. Uh, and, and it comes with the people of God seeking God. And if God happens to stir you at night and appear to you at night, uh, I hope I won't panic. I hope you don't panic. But if, he, if God should do this, then ask God for wisdom. Ask God for the help that you need to live the life he's called you to do. You might be a pastor. You might be a missionary. You might be a prophet. You might be a, a single mother. You might be the head of a household. Ask God, give me what, what I need, Lord, the wisdom to, to, to guide my family, to lead my family. And then verse 11, and God said to Solomon, listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, because this was in thine heart, and thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast thou, neither yet hast asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee. Verse 12, God said, I give you wisdom and knowledge. And then on top of that, because Solomon did not ask anything selfishly for himself, God said, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee. Neither shall there any after thee have the like. So that was a powerful experience, a powerful experience, an experience that, that I hope I can have with God, an experience that I hope you can have with God. And you might be saying, wait a minute, Pastor God, don't be, don't be putting that on me. Well, it's, 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 it's an experience where, oh, uh, where Solomon was in the presence of God and God spoke to to. To uh, this young man, he had called for a great venture and said, uh, "And what shall I give you? What what do you need?" And um, we all need something like this. Chapter two in um, Second Chronicles, Solomon uh, maintained the relationship that his father David had built with Hiram, the king of Tyre. Your Bible may call him Huram, H-U-R-A-M. Some call him Hiram. He was the king of Tyre. And Tyre and Sidon, that was actually the nation, the modern nation of Lebanon. Lebanon, where they were noted for their trees, their timber, their, the tall cedars of Lebanon, a great massive uh, trees used for construction. And Solomon Verse 1, determined to build a house for the name of the Lord and a house for his kingdom. And Solomon told out, told out three score and 10,000 men to bear burdens. So he had 70,000 laborers and four score uh, thousand to hew in the mountain. So he had 70,000 laborers. He had 80,000 men who would dig in the mountains and uh, dig out the minerals from the mountains, and 3,600 to oversee them. So he had um, 3,600 job supervisors. And Solomon sent to Huram, the king of Tyre, saying, As thou didst deal with David my father, and did send him cedars to build him a house to dwell in, dwell therein, even so deal with me. So they maintained that relationship. It was a good relationship. And that relationship between Solomon and Hiram lasted for a long time until after, uh, after chapter 
in chapter 8, we see Solomon building cities, building cities, and I think he gave as a, a reward, as a recompense to Hiram, Dave, um, Solomon gave Hiram 12 cities in Israel, and 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 Hiram said, "Hey, look here. These cities aren't worth my effort." He said, "You give me twelve of your worst cities." And so Solomon was not. I don't think he was very wise in what he gave to uh, Hiram, based on what Hiram had given to David to stockpile materials to build the temple, and how Hiram sent uh, uh, the timber and Hiram. Uh, had the laborers and that sort of thing, and in addition to the money uh, that Hiram sent to Solomon. Okay, so we see that Hiram was important. Uh, chapter 3, Temple Dimensions. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah was a very, very important place, ladies and gentlemen where the Lord appeared unto David his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And he began to build in the second day of the second month, in the fourth year of his reign. And I think it took David, I mean Solomon, seven years to build the temple. Seven years um, to build that temple. And so... It was very important that David experienced what he experienced, and we saw this in last week's lesson, where the Ark of the Covenant um, was touched by a man, and God killed that man because the oxen stumbled, and a man touched the Ark of the Covenant, and God killed him. And David was afraid to move the Ark any further, so he let uh, put the Ark in the in in the, in the home of. Um, uh, uh, a Gittite, God blessed uh, that man, and then David brought the ark to a piece of property that he had bought. He had purchased a piece of property from Ornan, the Jebusite, and the Jebusites were the original inhabitants of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem was named after Jebus, uh, the father of the Jebusites. And so David bought the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. That threshing floor became the, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was relocated when David brought the Ark into the city of Jerusalem. And that very spot, ladies and gentlemen, that very spot uh, became known as the Temple Mount. That On that very spot where... David purchased the threshing floor of Ornan. The temple was built by Solomon. So we see some very interesting uh, history in, in the scriptures. When you look at the dimensions, you get the dimensions for the temple, and these dimensions are laid out in chapter 3. The, the temple was not such a massive building. Um, verse 4 well, verse 3, now these are the things wherein Solomon was instructed for the building of the house of God. The length by cubits after the first measure was three score cubits. That's, that's 60 uh, cubits. And the breadth, 20 cubits. Now, 60 cubits is 60 times the length of a man's arm. 60 times the length of a man's arm. And the, the breadth, 20 times the le length of a man's arm. So the actual temple was not a great massive building as one would suppose and the porch that was in the front of the house the length of it was according to the breadth of the house 20 cubits the height was 120 and he overlaid it with with within with pure gold but this was a, a house of splendor overlaid with gold um, and um, made with the finest of materials so read that chapter See how the temple, the materials used and how it was built. Chapter 4, altar furnishings. Moreover, he made an altar of brass, 
20 cubits the length thereof and 20 cubits the breadth thereof and 10 cubits the height. The altar where the priest would make the sacrifices unto God. The altar was 20 times the length of one's arm wide, 20 times the length of one's arm in length, and 10 times the length of one's arm um, um, in, 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 in height. Also, uh, verse 2, he made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim and to brim, round and compass, and 5 cubits, the height thereof, and a line of 30 cubits did compass it round about. And under it was the similitude of oxen which did compass it about. So this was well sculptured. Uh, every item, every piece of this uh, temple, starting with the outer court and then going into the inner court, Oh, your your basins, your lavers, and candlesticks, and all everything was so carefully orna ornamented and done by skilled crafts craftsmen. Um, Solomon used skilled craftsmen. He asked God for people who were skilled in 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 doing certain things. In fact, like verse thirteen and four hundred pomegranates on the two wreaths two rows of pomegranates on each wreath to cover the two pommels of the chapters which were upon the pillars. So each pillar had a, a head on it, a chapter. So, I mean, you get your specifics. You, you get your specifics. And, you know, there are experts who can take these specifics and, and they've taken these and they've redesigned the, ta the, the uh, temple. They've redesigned uh, so you can see models of the temple. Uh, everything was made uh, for a purpose and made out of the best of uh, materials. Verse 16, chapter 4, the pots also and the shovels and the flesh hooks and all their instruments did Hiram, his father, make to King Solomon for the house of the Lord of bright brass. So Hiram is a very important person in the building of the temple of God. Chapter 5, the ark is moved. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in all the things that David, his father, had dedicated, and the silver, and the gold, and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers, of the children of Israel unto Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Wherefore all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast which, which was in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the Ark. And they brought up the Ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests. And the Levites bring up. You may say, well, what was the importance of the ark? The ark was a little box, ladies and gentlemen, about three and a half feet long, that, that reminded the Jews of the covenant that God had made with, uh, with them. And inside that ark was uh, the two, when David, when Solomon brought it up from the... Um, the threshing floor, the ark contained the two tables, the, the Ten Commandments. There, there was no evidence of a pot of manna or Aaron's rod that budded, but the two ta tablets were in the ark. And uh, everywhere, whenever the Jews went out to fight, during the time of the tabernacle period, um, the ark went before them. In other words, when people saw the Ark of the Covenant, they knew God was with Israel. God had made a covenant with Moses. God had cut a covenant with Abraham. God had made a covenant with his people. So the Ark symbolized the very presence of God. The Ark, uh, uh, when, before the Ark moved, the cloud moved uh, from upon, upon the Ark and, and went before the people. And at night, a pillar of fire uh, rested uh, where the ark was. And so God's people um, 
were, were set apart by God to be a very special people and a very special people whose responsibility was to obey God <coughs> and to worship him. Okay, and so Solomon brings the ark up and the ark, it was in the ark of the covenant, ladies and gentlemen, that God would reside. This is very important. God, a, uh, Solomon built a house for God, but it was within the ark of the covenant that was set between two cherubim whose wings touched. It was in the ark of the covenant that God would reside and <clears throat> never before. Never before had God uh, uh, agreed to dwell within a confined space. And God even said, this house can't contain me. And Solomon knew, this house can't contain you. But Lord, reside here. Reside here and bless Israel. So, this brings us to chapter 7. And we're going to ask uh, someone to read for us chapter 7. Chapter 7 contains the Lord appearing to Solomon and then um, God saying, um, God giving a great promise to his people. Remember, when the promise he made to Israel is a promise to all of us. Well, what do you mean, Pastor God, all of us? It means that everyone who's born again is now considered to be a child of God. Everyone who's born again receives those same blessings that God made to Abraham and the Jewish people. When God uh, extended the gospel to the Gentiles uh, after Jesus rose from the dead and, and, and the apostles took the gospel to the Gentiles, the Gentiles were grafted in Grafted in. In other words, the Gentiles were brought in under the promises that God had made to the Jewish people. The Jewish people rejected Jesus. Their leaders rejected Jesus. They asked the Romans to put Jesus to death. And, 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 and as a result, um, God opened the, the, the door of salvation to the Gentile nations. And... Um, but God is not finished with it, working with the Jewish people. The Jewish people, will, their eyes will be open after the rapture takes place. And uh, the believers, the believers are lifted up from the earth. Then the, the, the Jewish people will remain and, and, and the nations that re rejected God. And then God will open the eyes of the Jewish nation and Jews, the Jews will be saved. So it's going to be a very exciting, very exciting things uh, to come in the future. Let's get Dr. Bratton. Dr. Bratton, can you begin reading in Chapter 7 of Second Chronicles for us, please? Please feel free to stop and make any commentary you'd like. Is she with us, Jackie? He is with us. I'm not sure about what means. Okay, okay, okay. Karen, are you there? Carter. Yes, Karen, would you begin reading for us in Chapter 7 of, of Second Chronicles, please? Sure. Dedicating the House of God, Chapter 7, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priests did not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all of the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Then the king 
and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. And King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 20 and 2,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep to the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also with the instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to, the, to praise the Lord. Do it forever. You're in, you're in verse 6, the middle of verse 6. He must win out. Because his mercy endures forever. And when David prays by their ministry and the priests sounded the trumpets before them, all Israel stood. Moreover, Solomon howled the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brass and altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings and the meat offerings and the fat. Okay, also thank you, at the thank you, same thank time. you. Time out, time out. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, um, so Pastor Lisa Johnson. Something must have happened with um, Karen's volume or, or whatever, but Lisa came up and took over. But I want to stop there. The altar that Solomon had built in the, in the temple was not large enough to accommodate all of the animals that were sacrificed on this day of Dedication. Yeah, hold on just a minute, Karen. I'm glad you're back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Lisa Johnson took up and, and took took up your slack, so we're gonna have you start up again soon. But I'm just we're okay, commenting no on verse seven. Verse seven. Uh, remember, Solomon had offered a hundred and hundred and twenty thousand sheep and a whole lot of oxen, and so the altar was not large enough. So. Solomon consecrated the ground in the uh, uh, the inner court, the ground, and that ground was consecrated. And in, in addition to offering on the altar, they offered on the ground all those animals. A lot of animals were sacrificed unto the Lord on the day in which they dedicated the temple. Okay, Karen, uh, thanks, thanks, Lisa Johnson. We'll call you again. Uh, uh, Karen... Verse 8 of Second Chronicles chapter 7. <laughs> Karen, Karen and I, we're playing peek-a-boo, peek-a-boo. Okay, Lisa Johnson, can you read it? Read, start reading again at verse 8. Also at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him a very great congregation from the um, entering in of Hamath unto the river of Egypt. And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly, for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. And on the three, three and twenty day, twentieth day of the seventh month, he sent the people away into their tents, glad and merry in heart, for the goodness that the Lord has showed unto David and to Solomon and to Israel, his people. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord in his own house, he prosper, uh, uh, prosperously e effected. And the Lord appeared unto Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Hey, stop now there. My eyes... <clears throat> okay, thank you. Stop right there, please. Thank you, okay. uh, Co-Pastor Lisa. That is powerful. That is powerful. Um, um, Pastor Lisa, the Lord appeared to Solomon by night 
And that was an awesome experience. And God made some promises. He said, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or I send pestilence among my people. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Uh, we don't see it here, but if I send a coronavirus to the nation, if I, if I allow this plague or SARS and HIV plague and Man. Ebola, read verse 14 again, um, Lisa Johnson. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Let's go back to Karen in Fleetwood, Pennsylvania. Karen, can you hear me? Karen, can you oh, hello. hear me? Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Karen, based on verse 14, what four conditions does God place upon his people? Okay. Um, first of all, it's, it's, it's God's people. It's not the people of the world that aren't, aren't saved. He's addressing his people, which Amen. would be like you and me. Um, so that's really important because he's saying if my people, um, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves is number one and pray. So being humble and not being haughty and being prideful, but being humble and really seeking his face and praying um, and, and turning from their wicked ways, meaning repenting. So those are the four things. Humbling themselves, praying, and the third thing is seeking God's face. No one else is not not man, not running to man, but running to you know running to God for God's word, and then and, and also repenting, turning from the, the, their wicked ways. So those are the four things. Then then he will hear from heaven. And then and what else will he do? And then he will forgive sin and heal their land. It, it, it that sounds to me right there. You got a cure for the coronavirus, mm -hmm. Karen. Amen. Yep. <laughs> you got a cure for racism. Amen. You got a right. cure Amen. for violence and murder. Amen. You got a cure for homosexual homosexuality Amen. and lesbianism. Amen. And abortion. Karen, talk. What other cures do you see in there, Karen? It's for abortion. Yes. All that Baal worshiping that goes on every single day, yes. God sees that. But there's, there's so much blood there. Yes. Cure for witchcraft. Mm -hmm. abortion, is like, abortion is like uh, feeding our children to the god Molech. I mean, uh, the, the hundreds of thousands of children who are aborted each year. The millions worldwide. Why, Karen? Why, Lisa? Why, uh, Brian? Why don't people see this? Let's start with you, Karen. I I have no idea why they can't see that this, this is wrong. This I mean it's I mean it's it's very clear. If people open their Bibles and read and see that God did not approve of this from the beginning, so why would He approve of this now? Because it also says in our Bible that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God's not going to change His mind on these things and suddenly say it's okay, because that's not the way He designed it. So now it, it, people need to wake up and realize that this is wrong. But my sister, my sister, my sister, some will argue, this, we're living in New Testament age. We're, we're a New Testament Christian. We're New Testament believers. But it was still sin, and sin is sin, no matter what. 
And then you could tell them, well, you're a New Testament believing sinner because you, you, you've got to believe the Bible, all scripture. You know, there are scriptures you can give them. All scripture is given for, by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for Amen. correction, for instruction in righteousness. Yes. And, and we've got to be bold enough, Karen, to tell mm -hmm. people. But, but Karen, Karen, you, you offended me, Karen Herzog. I'm not. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm trying to tell you the truth in love, and this is this is the truth. And if I was not going to tell you the truth, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you the truth. Because if I withhold the truth, then I'm not doing what God wants me to do. There you go. There. So you're not. You're not going to be. You're not going to back down, are you, Karen? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I fought my calling, but God made it clear what I needed to do. So I'm not. The, I'm not making God mad at me. <laughs> okay. right. Praise God! Praise God! Praise God! Praise God! My my mama will say. My mama will say, and that's what God says. Now, if you don't like it, lump it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 You stand your stand your ground, Karen. Your ground is the word of God. All other ground is sinking sand. Okay, we stand Amen. on the word of God. And and some people you have to convince. Some people you have to persuade. Some people you have to just back off and just let them go and, and, and wait for another opportunity. But we stand on the word of God. And and Karen, can you force this down anybody's throat? No, no, definitely not, because then they're just going to, it's just going to get ugly. <laughs> and you know what? God gave us free will, too. He's not forcing, he's not forcing himself on us. It's, it's, it's a choice. But yes, we can still yes. plant seeds, but it's a matter of do they take hold or, you know, are they going to take hold or they're just going to, you know, sometimes, sometimes it's going to, you know, it'll, it'll take hold, but other times they just want to live the way they want to live, too. Yes, yes. And, and sometimes it's And the hyper time. grace Yeah. And the hyper grace movement actually puts a damper on things too because people think that they're saved and they, then they can live like they want to live and, and, that, and that, No, God didn't say that either. <laughs> yes, now, yes. People don't want to hear that. They they want to yes. hear I I'm forgiven, I can do whatever I want now. <laughs> no, I no. Find many Christians are like that. Many Christians I'm saved, I can do anything I want to do. I'm grown, I'm twenty one, I'm a Christian. No, no, no. We, God said, read that again, chapter, verse 14. Read that again, please, Karen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Karen. I want to, I want to, I want to go, I want to go down the highway from you about maybe fifty miles, Karen. Maybe okay. Maybe sixty miles to Norris Town. No, okay. no, no. We're, no, we're going to let's go to Coatesville, about sixty miles away. Okay, Pastor Lisa Johnson. Hi, hi there. Hi. How Pastor are you, Pastor Lisa Johnson? Yes. Have you run up against people who are so really stubborn? They see the word, but they have their own take on it. They they don't care what the word says. They're going to do what they want to do. Yes, they want to apply it to themselves and how they want it, how they think it is, but not according to what it says. You don't have to argue it or, or, or you know the word is the word. You know it, it's it's what God says. You know, and that's you know that's the way it is. Can I say it like that? <laughs> yes, yes, word, yes. Have you word, ever been word. hurt or beaten up by somebody who de decides they're not going to listen to the word, they're going to do whatever they want to do? How does that hurt you? It, it, it hurts, like, you know, because you um, put your heart out there sometimes, you know. And, uh, and um, I had got to a place one time, and I said, well, God said, well, I want you to tell them this. And I said, well, they ain't going to listen to me. <laughs> Can I say, like, yes. I've been there. I said that. I said, well, why should I? I said, I don't want to waste your words, God, because they're not going to listen, you know? And God told me to go ahead and do it anyhow. Go so ahead it's not and about do what it I anyhow. Feel and how I, want, I don't want to say it because they said it, but I just had to say it like, you know, just like um, 
she said, you know, I just you just say the word and just because it's, it's what he said. You know, you can't, you know, and even with uh, Christians today, um, uh, God was sharing with me uh, about they're foolish. And he said that in Galatians, oh, foolish Galatians, who, who has be with you and not knowing the truth. And we know the truth, but we want to yes. fit it around ourselves and our situation and make it the way we want to make it. But it's the word. Take people today, people today take the truth of God's word and they manipulate it. That's and it. they mold it and make it and shape it to fit their own uh, goals, their own uh, wishes. And, and, but God's it's word bad. is the same. God's, God is, we use the word immutable. God is immutable. He cannot change. He's not going to bend on his word. He's not going to let anybody bend or twist his word. This is a formula. Karen read it, and I asked her to read it again, and she read it again. She read it. It's right there, ladies and gentlemen. It's right there. And, 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 and you've got to have the love in your heart and the patience and the courage because when you, when you lay this on people, they're going to attack you. The first thing they're going to do is try to attack your pride. They're going to try to get you to lose your cool, Karen. And once they can get you to lose your cool, then they can get you off task. They can get you angry and upset and, and, and trying to, you know, argue your point. Don't argue. Don't, don't do that. Just give them the word and give it to them in love. And uh, if you have to take a walk, take a walk. But God's answer is right in there. God's answer. It's in the scriptures, so we've got to be bold enough, Karen, not to run when they attack us. And then, Karen, we've got to be bold enough that if we see that uh, we're, uh, we're in a situation where we've got to run, uh, then, then, take, then run. Okay, then run. If you've got to run and flee, uh, do so. And then God may bring you back another time. Okay? Okay. Um, I had a brother, and he said, he who runs a day lives to run another day. That is not scriptural. That is not scriptural. My brother Wayne said, he who runs a day lives to run another day. But there are times when you've got to choose your battleground. You've got mm-hmm. to uh, choose your attack. And there are times when the Lord says, no, not today. Wait till you hear the sound of the wind in the mulberry trees. And that's when I have you to attack. Well, thank you, ladies, for sharing. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and, and, and all of you, uh, be strong in the Lord. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. And always be willing to share the word of God. And if people will not accept it, then, uh, then you just have to shake the dust off your feet. But even in shaking the dust off your feet, don't shake it off condemning the people. Just realize, okay, hey, I can't get anywhere with this today. I'm shaking the dust off my feet. I'm going home, going to get me some rest, going to get me some sweet sleep. Maybe tomorrow I'll have another opportunity to share, and maybe tomorrow these people or this person will be open. Their heart may not be as hardened. Okay, Amen. chapter 8, Solomon builds these cities. Chapter 9, the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of Sheba, comes and visits with Solomon. No, our sister Loretta, we do not know her name. And there is no, I don't see anywhere when you read chapter 9, um, Minister Loretta or ladies and gentlemen, I don't see anything about a love affair between Solomon and Sheba. Uh, Dr. Gene Bratton, you see it there anywhere? Or Karen, do you see it anywhere? Does anybody see anything about a love relationship between Solomon and Sheba? Uh, No. No. I don't either. I don't either. But, you know, they've made movies about this. They've written books about this. And um, uh, I remember when I was in... In the 19, back in the 1950s, some of you weren't even around in the 1950s, but they had a movie called Solomon and Sheba, starring 
Stuart Granger, and who is that redhead? Not Maureen O'Hara, but somebody else. A uh, great um, a movie about the love relationship between Solomon and Sheba. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't see it in the Bible. So, Minister Loretta uh, and everyone else, be careful when people add on. Even when you get books like my book, Black Heroes of the Bible, you've got to read that book because I specify why I added the history that I did. But then I end up that story saying, hey, believe what the Bible says. Don't perpetuate uh, stuff that's not true. So we don't share fake news and false news because we go on what is truth. Okay, we see in Chapter 9, Solomon's death the end of chapter 9, and then we see Rehobo, Rehoboam, Rehoboam um, instead of starting with verse uh, chapter 11 next week, let's start with chapter 10. And so your assignment next week will be chapter 10 to the end of Second Chronicles. We'll start with the, the um, ascension of Rehoboam to the throne and starting there you get a better grip of what happens in the rest of Chronicles um, if we study the story of Rehoboam so you got you have a lot of reading to do for next week um, may, let me make sure we're right on target with the sil syllabus do we have two or three times in Next week, we take the rest of Chronicles, so make sure you do your reading, 11, start with 10, back that up, start with 10, 10 through 36, so a lot of chapters, but I, I'm quite sure you're going to get a lot of information, and that will even encourage us more to understand the days we're living in now and why we're experiencing what we're experiencing, not only nationally, not only locally, but worldwide. It's because the world has decided they, we don't need God. We're going to kick God off his own planet. And that's the position the world has taken. And sad to say, that's, position, that's the position that the United States of America has taken. And uh, I know there are people who argue, well, America is a Christian nation. America is not a Christian nation. There are Christians in America and we are in a minority. If you think because you're a Christian, you're in a majority in America, no, no. We are in a minority. But we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to stand. And the scripture says, and having done all to stand. Put on the full armor of God, ladies and gentlemen, and stand. And don't be afraid. Don't be scared. We're on the winning side. Let's do the best we can to tell others about God and to lead them to Jesus Christ and, and let the Holy Spirit do the work in them. You lead them, and then the Holy Spirit will do the work. Praise God. And let's do our assignment and do it well. And I praise God. We're going to end there. And... Um, we will, uh, we will entertain any questions you may have. Those of you re receiving the recording from in other nations and throughout this nation, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, put a message on our, our website or send me an email or a text message. I'll be glad to uh, share with you. And I thank you for those of you who do comment on the messages. You're, you're a blessing uh, to this ministry. Everybody, we're going to end the recording, and then we take time out to... Uh